knowing that, you know, you can restore a relationship after, I think people need to hear that, that like relationships can be restored, even if they're broken from an eating disorder. Welcome to the Juggling the Chaos of Recovery podcast, where we focus on health and wellness and overcoming all types of addictions. You're in the right place if you're a mom, dad, sibling, or caregiver who has a loved one who is or was struggling with an eating disorder or any other kind of addiction. In a time where everything seems heavy, I'm here to bring you a very real yet lighthearted take on what the heck we're all supposed to do with our lives while we care for our loved ones who are struggling. One thing holds true throughout it all. You can't juggle the chaos without smiling, at least a little bit. Well, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Moira Gorski. I'm so excited today because I have a couple of guests on the show today, which as I got connected with uh, one of them, the mother, and we started sharing our stories, it was like, oh my gosh, I think we've walked very similar paths. And I think it's really important to share, you know, as I've said on this podcast before, I'm the mom with a child with an eating disorder. So I leave her story up to her. Mm -hmm. um, And I want to talk about the impact that it's had on me and how I've been able to learn a lot of things through that. But today we have a mother and a daughter that are joining me and we're going to just talk through again, their journey together. And again, like I said, it's so similar to my journey with my daughter that the big aim of this podcast is to just make sure people don't feel like they're alone in this journey, be it the person that's going through the eating disorder or those that love them. So Stephanie and Alyssa, um, thank you for joining me today on my podcast. I'm really, really honored that you chose the time to be with me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to uh, have this conversation. And again, I met, you know, I'm on a couple of different support groups online. And um, I think that's how we met Stephanie. Like you may have said something I commented or vice versa or something like that. Yes. And we connected up. Yeah. And so I'd love to, as we um, as we start off today, is have Alyssa, who's the daughter, start just sharing your story of how about your eating disorder, as I tell people, not all of the details and all of the down and dirty stuff, but just really what's relevant, how it kind of started as it started, you know, to impact your life. Yeah. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with anorexia when I was 14. And I'm turning 26 soon. So definitely a big part of my life. And I guess my story, I, you know, when I was diagnosed, I was put into an IOP by my parents, kind of forced. But at the time, I I really did not want to get better. So it, it really, it caused a riff in our whole family dynamic. When I was 16, I went into residential and I was there for a while and then went to a day patient day program and then IOP and kind of did the whole thing. And it wasn't really until I was 18 where I was like, okay, I want to get better. Like, I'm so tired of living like this. And I feel like for me, that's when you know, all of the treatment, it did something, but it was when I said, I want to get better, that things actually started to change in my life. Like I listened to my dietitian, I listened to my therapist. Um, I found yoga, which is really a huge part of my healing process. And I was doing really well for a while, you know, college, I was worried about going to college and I, I was doing well. When I studied abroad, I had this moment, um, I was bungee jumping with some friends when we were abroad and they weighed me and I hadn't been, you know, I hadn't seen my weight in so long and seeing my weight and having it like written on my hands was just a really, it was a really triggering moment for me. And in that moment, I kind of knew I, I was going to go backwards. So that was, yeah, that was hard. Cause you know, for the past that was in my early twenties, like for the past three or four years, it's been hard just being in a relapse and then getting a little bit better and then falling backwards again. Um, all because I saw, you know, that number on my hands and the last year, again, I had that moment where I was like, I don't want to be like this anymore. Like I can't, 
you know, keep living my life like this. And that moment again, got me out of the quasi recovery cycle, the relapses. Um, I've made so many changes over the last year, year and a half. And now I'm at the point where, you know, I am, I'm comfortable with having fat on my body and I'm comfortable with eating a variety of different foods. And that's kind of what I've been striving for. And it feels good to be at this point where, yeah, because it's been, you know, just such a big part of my life having an eating disorder to the point sometimes where I I was like, am I going to be stuck like this? Mm-hmm. And yeah, being at this spot now, it feels, it feels really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thanks for sharing all of that. And a uh, couple of things in there before we go to you, Stephanie, you know, just that idea that, of seeing your weight. I mean, our daughter said the other day, she said, you know, she happened to see her weight in our dietitian, And it's just, it's just, it is, it can be triggering. And it's like, but then you also like somebody talked to me the other day about, she asked me how she can help her daughters when it's, you know, they're all concerned about weight and looks and all that, you know, they're her teenage daughters. And it's like, what can I do as a mom? And, you know, it's just, it's hard when social media and society and the magazines and all that show this image of that to be successful and happy and all that appears to be very small, skinny, low weight and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it really doesn't. And we all say, well, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter the number on the scale, but it, it can, I mean, it doesn't matter, but it also can be, there's a lot to deal with, right? When Mm -hmm. you're, uh, especially when you're restoring weight and you're used to being a certain weight and then now you are more weight and stuff like that. It's a, it's a tricky situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And so let's hop over to you, Stephanie. I know that you shared with me that you had your own eating disorder. And again, so similar to my story, Mm -hmm. but I just love to have you share from your perspective as you saw this kind of unfolding in your daughter's life, just how, what your feelings were around that and um, how that impacted you and your relationship with your, with your daughter and your family dynamics. I know we could talk about that for a few hours, but (laughs) let's talk about it. it short. I guess the best way that I always, and this is what, how I think we connected is you said that you lost your daughter and that's, we, my daughter and I were very close because she did, she did gymnastics. I was a gymnast. It was like our bond and we did everything together. And, you know, we shared, I, she was like, you know, a mini me, a little me. And then 14 hit. And it's like a monster came into the house to, to be, and you said that. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like what, what's happening here? And then to have to, I mean, I know I had an eating disorder, but mine was a different eating disorder and I kept mine more secret. It wasn't more, I wasn't at home. I didn't, you know, I was in college. So it was my eating disorder. It didn't affect the whole family. And I didn't really know how to handle it. You know, I didn't know how to handle, you know, seeing your daughter not eating and, and, you know, what do you do when you see, you know, you see someone you love hurting themselves. So it was, it was very hard. And I know she mentioned the first time bringing it. We, we did. I, took her to IOP. And I remember a a late, a girl there saying to me, she's like, you know, I came here. My parents brought me here. She worked there. And she said, I can tell you that unless your daughter wants to get better, she's not going to get better. And that always stuck with me that I eventually said, okay, Alyssa, you know, you don't want to go. You don't have to go. But again, we had to bring this. I mean, we weren't talking to each other. So it's not like I could even say that. I mean, we brought it home. And until she got to the point where she knew that this was she needed. And then she went back in for treatment. And for me, having her gone for that month that she was gone, it was like, and then we actually going in as a family and talking to somebody 
and someone telling us like, what do we need to do? How do we need to handle this? And it was, I mean, right there just changed our whole family anyways, the whole dynamics. I mean, the silver lining of her eating disorder is that it has made me grow as a person and, and our family grow as a person. We've just learned so much about ourselves, how to handle difficult situations, how yelling and screaming and none of that, no matter what is happening in your life, is not going to change someone's behavior. You know, you can't, and that's my silver lining out of all of this. Because mm-hmm. it's been, as she said, it's been a long road. Yeah. But I do believe that mm-hmm. that she's there. And when you're saying about the weight and stuff, you do have to get to the point where it really doesn't matter. And you have to ignore society's standards of what of what is out there. And you have to believe what is right for you. No matter what you see out there, you just have to believe and trust in yourself and your body and where your body is supposed to be and not what any, and that's hard. It's very hard. Well, and at first, there was a couple of things that you said um, there that I want to go to. You talked about when she was gone for a month. Yeah. So how, how is that when your child is in treatment in your home? Like, how did that What's that? What, what was that like for you? I know what it was like for me, and I'll share that. But what was it like for you when she was in a treatment facility when you were at home? It was a relief. It was honestly, it was like I know that you know it, it was hard having it there because we would visit a lot. Well, we really weren't allowed to visit for a couple of weeks. They had they had her, and then mm-hmm. then we would come in, and it was for me. It was a a breathe <laughs> selfishly it's, no it, but it's true yeah yes, it's true it was, it was like I I don't know it was like this huge cloud was gone for a little bit for me to think she's getting better and that's all I cared about was that she right. was getting better and that the responsibility was off of me as a parent right to think that I have to get her better, that it's my fault that she's here and I need to get her better. And that's not the way. (laughs) No, but that's, I mean, exactly. That's what I went through, you know, because it's like somebody else is taking care of her. One of my girlfriends said, who had gone through this similar, similar in putting her children and child and a couple of her daughters in treatment. She said that, you know, when you come home, now take a breath. Now take care of yourself. Spend time with your other kids. I had another, you know, my younger son was at home. Yeah. And it and it was like, okay, now I got a time, now I got time to spend with Tommy. You know, that there wasn't all of this chaos in the house and he and I could connect or I could take care of myself. So I totally get that. It's not, I mean, it sounds selfish, but it's like, okay, somebody else is taking care of my daughter and we don't have. We don't have to take on as the mom, we don't have to take on that responsibility. And then like, we have to be the police. We have to be the disciplinarian. Somebody else is doing that. Right. Take it and make. And you know what? It's see, I didn't have that. I didn't have the support of my family because anyone around me and, and what's sad about this, and this is why I'm glad we're doing this is it's like, an eating disorder, it feels like a dirty little secret, right? That you can't like, oh, your daughter has an eating disorder. Um, I mean, this is what, oh my God, like, you know, it's like this awful thing that you don't feel like you can share. And that was another thing. It's like, you know, now I can go talk to people. I can talk to professionals. I can see what's ahead of me because nobody else was able or willing to do that. So, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, and it, then the next thing is that family therapy, um, you know, and getting the family involved. And that I know I've shared with you was just a big part of um, our la- our daughter's last treatment stay was just hugely um, beneficial. Um, I don't think that everything is healed, but I've gotten to the point of like, okay, this h- helped you know, bring the family closer together. What I love that it, like when I, when we did, I'd be interested to hear about your, the family therapy and how it was conducted and stuff like that. But with Anna, 
it was like her therapist wanted to get to know my husband and I first and did a few meetings with us first, just to get to know us, how we discipline, how we saw things in the home, you know, our perspective on things. And then she brought our daughter in, you know, to, to then process through some things. And then she invited the sibling, you know, the brothers in. And so sometimes the brothers would come in and sometimes they wouldn't. And, you know, so, but it was a chance for everybody to have their say. Yeah. And the therapist was so good to say, okay, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this? And like went around and has this neutral, you know, and encouraged everybody to share regardless if they thought it was good, bad, or ugly or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it just, it was so, I think it gave a chance for everybody to kind of understand each other and like what was going on. And, you know, for Anna to hear that, but Anna also to share, and then this neutral third party to kind of come in and help through all of that. Through, we did, we had that at Walton, didn't we? Did we have some family therapy? Um, We did in IOP. Yeah, but it was, yeah, when I was in IOP, we had sessions like that where we, the fan, yes. And I know we had where before the, before Alyssa came in, we would all, the family would all sit down and, and they would talk to us. But as far as like an individual therapist, I don't know if we, we did an IOP and I know my son would come in and talk. And he would talk to us, but we never really, did we have? I don't remember having, yeah, like being part of the session. I know they had their own sessions, like mm. my mom and my dad with the therapist or the social okay. worker at my residential. Yeah. And they had sessions where an IOP, like all of the families from each person would gather together and talk with the therapist there. Yeah. But with, it's also, which, yeah, again, I think everything we've had those times too, even when I, when my husband and I came out to um, ERC in Denver yeah. for like the fam- family days, there was like a day that they did all kinds of like kind of education for the, for the parents. And then we mm-hmm. went out to lunch and then we came back and then we got to see our ch- child and we did some stuff together. Yeah. But my husband said, you know, the best time was the lunch where we got to sit around and like talk to these other and, you know, my husband had never really been, I kind of had taken, you know, taken care of this or whatever. So he hadn't really interacted with any other dads or, you know, that kind of thing. And it was so helpful for him to feel like, wow, I'm not alone kind of thing. And that was the best part of that type of connecting. But um, mm-hmm. since you brought up your your brother, the, your son, I'd love to hear from you too, Alyssa, about kind of how that was with, do you just have the one brother? Yeah, just yeah. one brother. Mm-hmm. And he's younger or older? He's older. He's two years older. Yeah. Okay. So how was that dynamic um, with when you were struggling? And, you know, how how did that, um, how's that dynamic with your brother? Yeah, I mean, throughout high school, he was kind of off doing his own thing. Like, he was definitely the person that was more popular and, like, had more friends. And I you know, from a young age, I was a perfectionist. Like I was always did really well in school and like was doing sports. So we didn't really spend that much time together. And he, he knew what was going on. Like he saw us fighting all the time. Um, but he was kind of like disengaged from, from what was happening until I went into treatment. And then I think he realized the severity of it. And as you know, when I relapsed and I was 21 he he was involved like he you know he was older at the time he was more mature and he knew what was going on he kind of knew the cycle and you know as he's gotten older even now he's more kind of emotionally available like but in high school you know he was just like very distant from what was happening would you say that was- what well, and like I said in a, in a a strange way. I mean, my son had some issues too. And I think what happened to Alyssa was kind of like an awakening for my son to, to see. Yeah. I, you know, we know all of the addictions, you know, it's mm-hmm. 
other problems that society has presented us. And I don't want to disclose, but my son had those as well. And I think, and also has anxiety. And I think it was an awakening for my son to see his sister. Cause I don't think he believed like, like everybody else. It's like, just make her eat. Mom. Yeah, Why can't yeah. you just make her eat? What's wrong with you? And then yeah. he'd be like, he'd see us like, what Alyssa, just come on. Why are, and then to see that and then to see, oh my God, she's going, she has to go to treatment right now. If she doesn't, she's possibly could die. Then it hit him and he would go and visit you and he would come yeah. with us and visit us. And I think for him, it was a, a blessing in disguise. I don't know. It, it's made him more emotionally intelligent, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Made him more compassionate. Like when I, I was traveling in India three years ago and was very underweight, very sick, um, not doing well. And when I came back, like he was, you know, able to show up for me more. Like he, he didn't, he doesn't really fully get the extent, you know, of an eating disorder, but now he has a girlfriend and I can see that he's more, you know, he, he's more compassionate. And I think he understands like the body image piece with her and is able to kind of see these things a little more clearly because of what I went through. So I think it has, it's definitely changed him and how he operates. Brought to you by Gorski Wellness and the possibility of a better you. Are you feeling sluggish? Ready for a change? Need more energy? Up for a bigger challenge? I'm Moira Gorski, retired nurse and wellness advocate. For over 22 years, I've been helping people live healthier lives while making small changes each and every day. Those small changes lead my clients to living a healthier lifestyle with markedly better health. As a brand ambassador for the Shackley Corporation, the most clinically proven wellness company in the world, I guide my clients to make healthier choices each day with their food, supplements, skin care, workouts, and mindset. They say getting started is half the battle. Let's make healthy happen together. If you're ready for simple, natural, sustainable solutions to feeling and looking your best, let's connect. You'll find a link in the show notes or reach out to me at moiragorski.com. Here's to a better you. Again, so many similarities. It's just <laughs> uncanny. But, um, but I say that, you know, cause I know that, um, like our youngest one, like he saw everything he saw his sister, but you know, he saw the struggle. I mean, my oldest one went off to college and after that, the chaos kind of started here. So he was kind of separated from it and he came home occasionally. And then he was pretty soon out of here because he was like, Oh my God, what's going on. And he would go home. He would go back. But he saw, you know, our second guy, he had some, again, kind of in and out of school and had some struggles too. So our son saw it, our youngest, and was like, okay, well, everybody's messed up. So I'm going to be messed up. Like, you know, took that on. It's like, that's what's, you know, going to be. And, um, and of course, you know, that doesn't, ha- that doesn't have to be true. But um, I get that whole, and again, I'm not going to talk about the feelings from the other kids, but I get what you're saying that sometimes because it isn't just, oh, okay, what's wrong with Alyssa? What's wrong with Anna? Like it is a family. There's this dynamic that causes these things or causes some things to happen. So sometimes when somebody starts to struggle, so I think this is what you're saying, or this is what I'm hearing, is that when somebody starts to struggle so publicly, it kind of, if people are open to it, it makes them aware of like what's going on and maybe, you know. And like, how is your behavior like, Right. really affecting this because a lot of us like, well, it's not my fault. I didn't have, it It makes you more self-aware of like. How, yeah. And like what, maybe what's going on with me and how am I yeah. dealing with my stresses? Alyssa's dealing with it this way. How am I? So how are you? Um, yeah. yeah. But I also want to share again, there's all those, like you said, silver lining and, and I don't, you know, I don't know if that's what this is about, but like our oldest son just got married this last weekend. It's a Aww. beautiful weekend. And, um, um, thank you. And two years ago, a couple, two years ago, like he, my daughter was trying to reach out to him and be in touch with him. And he just cut her off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, she had asked from one of her treatment stays, 
you know, for people, everybody to write a letter to her about how the eating disorder had impacted them. And everybody wrote one and sent it to her, except for him. So I called him, said, come on, where's your letter? And then he like, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay, that's what you put in a letter. He's like, okay, should I send it to you? I go, no, you should send it to your sister. He never did. Mm -hmm. He would never correspond with her. And it hurt her so badly. But I also said, okay, but everybody deals with things different ways. And he said, I can't, he goes, I can't deal with the, it's too emotional for me, this up and down and she's good and she's bad and she's good and she's bad. And it was kind of like, when you're better, I'll talk to you. And again, it's a hard, that's hard in so many ways, but that was the reality of it. And the beautiful thing is that this last week, I mean, the beautiful, beautiful things were when Paul got engaged, he reached out to Anna and asked her to be in the way. Like, I mean, it was, and, but I also said, okay, that's wonderful, Paul. And please have this, you can't have like something may happen. I mean, she comes home, she relax, you know. So, I mean, when we look at the patterns, I said, you have to, I just want, I think it's wonderful, but you also have to have this realization that maybe she's not going to be well, you yeah. know, but yeah. she was. And even Anna said last weekend, she said, you know, I just so thankful for Christy, who is Paul's wife. We were thankful for her in, for so many ways, but she said, you know, because Paul talked to Christy and Christy talked to Paul and because this was things that came out and that Paul would say that like Christy, you know, Paul would say like Christy and I have talked about this. And like, so he's, he was able to, from what I heard, you know, process some of this stuff with his fiance, who's a uh, nurse who was like, and then he was more open to Anna and all that. So again, it's just was like this beautiful. And we had this beautiful family weekend together. It just, I, it was so wonderful in so many ways because of a lot of what we're talking about today is that, you know, there's been this broken apart family when there's a crisis and you, you just, and I've learned, like you said, um, Stephanie, like I've learned to be a better person and a different person and to set boundaries and to do all those kind of things and also surrender and trust that everybody's going to kind of come through their thing on their own that I can't control that anymore. Right. <laughs> but I just want, but I also wanted this whole weekend to be like so beautiful for the family. And so I just held space for it. And I'm telling you, it was, it, it wasn't perfect. Nothing ever is, but it yeah. was wonderful as a family. Like we haven't been together like that as a family with everybody in a pretty good place for so many years. Aww. And so it's that hope, you know, that's what I love to share here. But I also love when people say, yeah, the silver lining of this crap that we went through. I mean, one of my first, one of my first episodes of this uh, podcast was with my best friend who went through a couple of things with her daughter. She talked about the silver lining of all those things, the things that she learned, the fact that she could, um, that she crocheted um, scarves on her plane ride Every week that she, you know, went from Chicago to um, North Carolina, she made a different scarf for one of the girls in wow. the treatment, you know, and just like, oh, who do you have a scarf for today? And it's like those different things that like you're in the midst of all of this chaos. But those those things that like I still have the scarf she made for me. She knows that people, the girls still have the. She goes, that was the thing that I could do. Mm-hmm. Right. for these girls just to make a crocheted scarf in the color that they wanted when I was sitting there trying to deal with the crap in my head that my daughter was struggling so much you know it's wonderful and that's what you have, you have to do I mean like you said you kind of have to surrender to whatever is going to happen it's going to happen and and try to take care of yourself and your own mental mm-hmm. well-being so you can show up mm-hmm. Or whatever and and a lot of times I didn't do that through all this I didn't take care of myself mentally but it taught me to you mm-hmm. know it really did the 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 importance of that yeah well that's the thing I learned that if I didn't take care of myself I was no good to me my daughter my family my business anything, anything. so we have to we have to do that first right we talk about it all the time we got to put the oxygen mask on first but it's so that's what it's all about yes It's been a while since I talked to somebody um, about yoga and kind of in that 
healing and recovery and stuff like that. I've have a few episodes of, you know, some good friends of mine that found yoga and it was, so I'd love to have you share about that, Alyssa, just kind of how, how yoga, you know, did come in and help you through your, your recovery. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually started yoga when I was 15 and that was when I was, you know, in the midst of my disorder. And I started a course with hot yoga and it wasn't until I was in college, I would say like 19, I found this one yoga teacher, Kim. Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. And she was just so gentle in how she taught like her whole presence it, you know, especially coming from a hot yoga atmosphere and coming to just like more of a gentle style of yoga. She was just so warm and gentle. And it helped me to realize that my relationship to movement didn't have to be so intense. Like I could move in a more gentle, like nurturing way with myself. And I think that's the whole point of yoga in a way is self-compassion. So after like I was doing yoga throughout college and really tuning into just like how I felt, you know, I I feel like yoga was my form of meditation at the time. Like I wasn't, this was before I started meditating and it was, you know, moving meditation for me. And then I went on to do um, a teacher training and started teaching and yeah, it really just changed how I viewed movement in a way too. Um, and it helps, you know, I have a very anxious mind. I think a lot of people with eating disorders can relate to that sentiment and it helped me to get grounded in a way that I couldn't do by going even just for a walk. Like there's something about the practice where it's repetitive, you know, you're, you know, it's coming that it, it helped me find some stability in my life. And I still, to this day, like it's, you know, it serves such a great purpose for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. It's um, yeah. People have shared that it's that they could be imperfect, you Mm -hmm. know, in yoga and help them realize that it didn't have, there didn't have to be that perfectionism, that it could be something that they got on the mat and um, Mm -hmm. could enjoy it and not have to be perfect. I find that yoga is that place to, I learned, it taught me how to be present, Yeah, you know, like present to the moment and all of that, what same thing with like an anxious mind and stuff like that. But it's good. Again, we talk about on this podcast, so we have to find things that we can put in our tool belt that are really the things that help us on a daily basis stay, you know, stay in a good place, stay at a high vibe, if you will. And uh, so you still teach today too? I I took a break from teaching while I'm finishing graduate school, but it's, yeah, I was teaching all last year and Mm -hmm. during COVID and yeah, it's something that, you know, I really, I loved like teaching and just forming community with people and now I'm finding that Mm -hmm. in different ways, but yeah. 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 Cool. Um, you know, what would you, um, I mean, this came up when I was thinking about when I was preparing for the interview too, I just wondered perhaps what you would want to say to your mom or maybe what you wanted to say to your mom during this whole time, or maybe what you'd want to say to her today. And kind of the same thing with you, Stephanie, kind of like what you wish maybe she knew during that time from you or those kind of things, if that makes sense. I just thought that might be kind of interesting for you guys to share as we look at wrapping this up today. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's funny. I, I wrote this letter to my mom last year just it was a whole apology letter for how you know for how I acted during my eating disorder I feel like people don't talk about just how mean you become you really become a terrible person and I projected a lot of that specifically onto my mom because she was somebody that I was close with and comfortable with so yeah just there's probably like, I could say sorry again and again, you know, for the rest of my life, but because there was just a lot of, a lot of things that were said that were mean, you know, even when I was in my early twenties, like you're supposed to be maturing. And I just felt like my disorder kept me like in the brain of a 15 year old. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering when you said that, that's what just came up because I've heard that before too. And I've, I think that there's some truth to that, that 
when you start to develop your your eating disorder or your struggle, kind of like when that began, like you said, 14, you kind of get stuck in right. that 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 maturity level of when you started. And yeah. um and and I think there's some truth to that. And also like almost like you missed out on like, if it's two years that you struggle or three or four, whatever you missed out on that, like normal maturity during that time or the things that you go through that help you mature through that time. And so yeah. when you're in a better place, it's like, it's almost like you have to not relive, but you know what I mean? You have to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, go through some of those things and process through the stuff that you would like as a 16 or an 18 year old that you never really had the chance to, cause you were deep in the midst of your right cloud of crap yeah 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 definitely I I feel like I had to do a lot of emotional maturing you know because this is a decade of my life where I was like stuck in this so I think yeah like that really showed sometimes in how I acted especially when I was sick towards my mom Mm -hmm. well and I they say that you know that the person that that you're like kind of the meanest to or like always are reaching out to is the one that you feel the safest with and the closest right. to. Yeah. So it doesn't doesn't make us feel any better when they're when you're yelling at us and you know telling us how you know we suck and you made that why did you right. put me here and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. I would say to like it wasn't your fault, you know, and I've said that to her before because I know that when I was younger and struggling, she thought it was her fault like I was a competitive gymnast and she had an eating disorder I think for me like I just want you to understand and we were talking about this yesterday because I'm I'm studying this thing in school and it's helping me get a new understanding of why eating disorders develop and I think I just I said to her yesterday that I was so anxious at the time of puberty I had you know, I didn't feel like I belonged. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel like safe in the world. And, you know, like, it's not your fault that I I felt like that. I think a lot of people do, and we just don't know how to express. We don't have the words at the time when we're younger. And it, the amount that my mom has done for me, especially like in my early 20s to like the last three years to fully get past like my relapses my quasi recovery is just amazing like the way that she's able to show up for me when I'm living in Colorado even now it's like uh, nobody else would do the things that she does for me like especially you know as I've like gained more weight the past year and the way that she's able to reassure me and I see my mom living as a fully recovered person And just the times, even when she visited me in March, like, it's just so, she inspires me, like the way that she is with food and her body. And so there's, yeah, there's just a lot of things. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say, you ready to talk now, Stephanie? Yeah, 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 right. I love you. Thank you. Yeah, and just, it is. Yeah, I just I'm so glad that you know our relationship is back, like to where it was when I was like 11, before you know all of my stuff started. Because we really do. We're just we're like best friends, and knowing that you know you can restore a relationship after. I think people need to hear that that like relationships can be restored, even mm-hmm. if they're broken from a eating disorder. Absolutely. It's true. I mean, that's a brilliant statement and it is true. Like, again, we talked about it, Stephanie, like you feel like, I mean, I have a, a good friend in town that I, um, who lost, who her, her son died from cancer. And, um, you know, but we've had conversations about like, you lost your son, but I feel like I've lost my daughter. You know, when she's in the midst of all of this, you feel like you lost her. And it's a beautiful day when you start as me as a mom, as I started to see my daughter come back and like the, I mean, this is the way my daughter is like, we're driving in the car and she's just talking, 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 talking. And then she changed subjects and she's like, no, what was I talking about? And I'm like, there she is. Like, know, that's right? my daughter. Like, she's so like, I'm like, just keep talking. It's fine. Because I know you're back when you're like, you know, blood. and she goes to the next subject. And 
No, wait a minute. What was I talking about? <laughs> it's just so my daughter. And it's such a beautiful feeling when you see them because we just love them, right? We love our children right. and we just want them to be um, happy and healthy. But, you know, I know because you just want... I. I, it's a beautiful relationship that you guys have. And um, I had the same thing with our daughter and then just all this stuff. And I feel like we've gotten back to, you know, kind of the same, but also we're both older. So it's just a different way. Right. Um, yeah. And like you said, Stephanie, you've grown, Alyssa, you've grown like I've, you know, and so it's a different way of you know, now I don't do certain things or say certain things, or now I do say, you know, because of what I've learned through that. But it's a beautiful day when, you know, we can putz around and go shopping and laugh and, you know. Oh my gosh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, because that was probably the hardest, like you said, it was the hardest thing for me is that losing, she was, you know, someone that was so close to me and having her here physically, but, you know, and I'm just so happy for, and she has just taught me so much I mean so much about eating disorders and recovery and because I never went through treatment you know Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've learned a lot you know and there's a lot and she'll always say to me mom it's not about the food really it's there's so much more involved Mm -hmm. it's not really the food in front of me and everybody thinks that but it's like she was saying it's anxiety it's so many other things which has taught me because, you know, I always thought it was just the food, but there's other deeper issues involved with it. Mm-hmm. You know, that, I mean, it's what you choose to grab onto to help you deal with something else going on. If I've learned anything yeah. from this podcast and interviewing all these people throughout the last couple of years, it is, it's like, it, it could be the alcohol, the drugs, the porn, the shopping, the eating, the not eating, the injury, you know, all that kind of stuff. It That's just a symptom of, or it's just what you choose to, to help you to cope, right? Help you cope with whatever else is going on. And until you on. pull all that stuff back and talk about what's going on, mm-hmm. it's not going to, you know, and there's some people that go from one disorder, one addiction to another, because they never really... Right know how to deal with this other stuff that's going, that's on, going on underneath and she taught me that she really through every I mean and I'm just so proud of her it's mm-hmm. really um yeah it's it's hard it's hard work that they go through and like you said Alyssa too like you're tired like it's an exhausting it's exhausting to keep this stuff up right yeah. to keep your yourself up your life up you know when you're in the midst of a disorder, it's exhausting. Right. Yeah. Exhausting. She's also, I think her has chosen her career path to help people yeah. with eating. And I think she's going to be wonderful. I really, she's already seen clients and I see. So for me, that's also good. You know, wow. You know, you're taking something and you're going to use what you went through, which is, I think will help even more if, you'll understand it even more. And she's using it to help other people. So mm-hmm. it's wonderful. Yeah. It is wonderful. And I commend you for doing that because I feel like that's that's who should be doing the therapist right. or yeah. the dietitians or the whatever they are because you've been through yeah. hell and back. Right. And you know, like my daughter will say, like, I'd love to like be a therapist or something and say, and when they say, oh, I don't want to put the, I don't want to have a tube in. Uh, you don't understand. And you, and she's like, I could tell him, I understand. <laughs> you know? I, <laughs> I had to do, you know, I had to do that four or five times or whatever. So you have that shared experience. And so you can say, I get it. Right. You know, I get it. And again, I'm a living example. You can say okay. I'm a living example of that. You can get through this and you can yeah. recover. Mm-hmm. And how many okay. times did you, I mean, how many times did I tell my daughter that like, look at the people around you. They their recovery is possible when she was in the midst of like, not really believing that she could ever recover, you Mm -hmm. know? So I commend you for doing that. And uh, again, I'm just so thankful for that. We got connected because it's just, again, our stories are so similar. And I believe that there are many other mother daughters 
mother sons that are out there, father sons, whatever, that are going to hear this episode and be like, yeah, I, I can totally relate to it and, um, and can learn from it and, and things like that. So I'm really just grateful that we, that we're able to connect and that you were willing to come on and share, share your stories, um, Mm -hmm. stories here. Um, I hope the same. I hope that we can know, show people that you're not alone because a lot of times you feel that you are alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you for yeah. allowing us to do this. It was yeah. very excited about it. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're very welcome. And um, yeah, best of luck to you guys as you move forward um with your life and, and all of that. Any parting words, Stephanie or Alyssa? No, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us to share our story. Um mm-hmm. because we really ha- I mean. I haven't really. Um, yeah. And it's, I'm so grateful that, um, yeah, that I'm able yeah. to, to share and hopefully help somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you're very welcome. Again, I, I just, uh, you know, I do these when I get, I get that reminder every time I um, just open this up for people to share because um, I do truly believe that we can continue to help others when we share our stories and we shouldn't be, there is, it shouldn't be any shame Thank the you. stuff that we went through and it's, it's hard to, hard to understand. And again, it's hard for those other people to understand, but I think even more and more just keep sharing because, um, as I said to somebody who I talked to a couple of weeks ago, cause I've seen it with others, like the more that we can share our story, the more it keeps us on the path of doing the right thing. Doing the right and helping people recover, right? Right. I want to wish you and your daughter and your family. Yeah. The best. I really do. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. You're doing quite well. And congratulations on your Yeah, thank you. It was a great weekend. And again, just, you know, I got so many, um, again, I'm all over, you know, people know I'm just very active on Facebook. So lots of pictures out there. And I had friends that texted me and sent me private messages and said, the joy of that we saw in your daughter's face and the beauty in there. She said, it just, it just made them so happy. So, you know, it's just, it's, um, you know, I want this to be a, a story of hope. Like, like we said, recovery and that things can get better and they don't always stay better, but they can be better. And right. we need to, as I said to my daughter and more people there, like we just, we're just happy to be present right here. And to enjoy this moment because it's awesome. Yeah. And that's all we have, right? All we have is today. The past is the past. Tomorrow's a promise of the future. So, like all we have today is today, and let's make it great. Let's make it a good one. Thank you. So that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so thanks much. for being with me, ladies. And um again, thanks for listening, everybody. Please continue to share these episodes with others that um that need and want to hear them because we can continue to share these stories of hope and recovery. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Share it with others and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. I've got a tribe over on Facebook, so head over there and search for Juggling the Chaos of Recovery Podcast Tribe. And do you know somebody who has a story, a story to share, a story of recovery and hope, please let me know as I'd love to feature them as a guest on one of these next upcoming podcasts. And perhaps you're looking for a community of like-minded, collaborative, and supportive people who cheer each other on as we strive to improve our lives. If that sounds like something you've been looking for, schedule some time with me. You'll find the links in the show notes. Let's talk and let me help you find your way. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth it.